good morning, church family. It is so good to see you. It is good to not see you, but you're, uh, you see me. I'm so glad you guys that are online with us today. Thanks so much for, for joining in. And realize there's room here for you when you're ready to come back and feel it's safe for you and for your family. Still, the balcony's got lots of room up there. And uh, it's good to see the numbers that are here today. I think we're larger than last week. So more are beginning to come back in. And, and that's great. So it is great to see you good to be in the house of the Lord. Wasn't it worship a sweet time today? You know, if that doesn't light your fire, the old preacher said, your wood's wet, right? So it's so good to be here. We get, we're living in a, a really weird time, are we not? Just crazy things are happening all around us. You know, even this morning I read where a police station was broken into. They stole all the toilets and the police have nothing to go on. <laughs> That's bad. That's really bad now. <laughs> <laughs> that was on the auto collision as I'm coming for it today. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Oh, it's a, it's a strange world in which we live in. I, I hope you're with us Wednesday night as we begin to talk about that dialogue with the racial tension that's all in our nation right now. And again, this coming Wednesday night, we'll do so again. I've got a pastor friend from an African-American church that'll be with me. And uh, we'll get a chance to just kind of drill down deep into this and hopefully gain some insight into to things that need to change, attitudes and actions that may be in us that need to change and in our world as well. So I don't know about you, but I don't like standing in line. Do you like standing in line? You know, no one likes standing in line. Yet I have this knack of always picking the line that's the slowest. You know, it doesn't matter if I'm at the grocery store, if I'm on the interstate. It doesn't matter. I always pick the one that is the slowest line. However, the reality is, is that we're all in line, right? Where every one of us is in line to die. Yes, I have the gift of encouragement. Are you encouraged today? <laughs> No, but we're all in line. We're all in line to, to die. The Bible is very clear. We have a birth date, we have a death date, and we have a court date. Birth date, death date, court date. You remember what Hebrews tells us about this? And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes, say the word, judgment judgment and that's a reality it is woven into the fabric of our being somewhere deep down inside we can deny the reality we can ignore the reality but we know there is a reality we will one day give an account of our lives now I think this is very significant I think this is what plays into the pandemic panic the pandemic panic has been greatly exasperated because of the fear of death and the uncertainty of eternity. You know, if people were confident about death and confident about eternity, they probably wouldn't have nearly as much apprehension as they have today. However, the Bible tells us that one of the primary reasons that Jesus took on flesh why he went from being the eternal uh, word of God, Logos, and he actually embodied himself in flesh like we have, was to remove the fear of death and the uncertainty about eternity. Listen to the way Hebrews says it. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, children, that's us, we have flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing that through death, his death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. You see, the truth is really simple. When you're ready to die, you're ready to live. And when you've got the death thing down and the court thing down, now you're ready to really live life to the full. So I thought we ought to explore a story of Jesus that helps us to, to gain insight, incredible insight into death and to life beyond the grave. A few weeks back in our church recommended quiet time passage, we dealt with the, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. You remember that? A few weeks back we were going through that. And as I was reading that very familiar passage that morning, truths began to leap from the pages at me. And I thought, well, there's a sermon. 
there's a sermon there's a sermon there's a sermon and so I began to see all these sermons within this one story that Jesus gave us so I want us to take a few weeks now to kind of look at lessons from beyond the grave now if you're not there yet turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16 we'll begin in verse 19 today what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an overview and and then we're going to drill down deep in just one truth okay so I'm going to give you an overview and then we're going to drill down deep into one truth that I say see leaping from this passage let's read the text There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. Besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now, let me let me outline the passage for you in an overview. You have two men, two destinies and two questions, two men two destinies and two questions you have the two men you have a rich man you have a poor man look at the rich man a little bit closer here the rich man was clothed in purple now the purple that we're talking about here is not the purple of Lydia remember Lydia from Philippi who was a dealer a merchant in purple no it wasn't that kind of purple this was a different kind of purple this was the purple that came from a sea snail (laughs) say that a lot of times a sea snail called the murex okay and inside this little sea snail there is one tiny little drop of purple and so this man would have his clothing produced by the dye that's found in this little tiny sea snail it would take tens of thousands of these harvested from the sea extracting the purple just to dye this man's clothing it was a clothing of royalty his clothes were not from Walmart either they were from Egypt Okay, he, he was in the finest of linen, the finest that could be purchased we're talking about Burmese lotus flower silk cloth Google tells me that's the most expensive uh, clothing or cloth in the world today and Google can't be wrong, right? So we're talking about fine, fine linen and he wore this, how often? Every single day. Now let that sink in. Every single day he wore purple and his fine linen. Not special events, not great celebrations, not on Sabbath worship, but every day of his life. You know, have you ever seen me on my day off? My wife looks at me, she says, 
you're not going to Lowe's like that, are you? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, who cares, you know? you know? But not this man. This man, he was always in his fine linen. And then fourth, he feasted sumptuously every day. Now notice that it says every day he feasted sumptuously. We're talking about porterhouse steak and shrimp daily. No PB&J for him, okay? He feasted, and then he also lived in an opulent home. An opulent home, more like a palace because it had walls around it, and it had gates where someone could be laid. That was the rich man, the poor man. The word for poor here is pokos. It's a word that literally means absolute poverty. It's the same word that is used for our Lord. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter, um, chapter 8, it says that he became pokos. He became poor, destitute, a peasant, a pauper, so that we, through his pokos, his poverty, might become rich, really rich. He was also miserably sick. He didn't have a, a single sore. The scripture says that he had sores all over his body. And the word used here is a word that's used to describe an oozing, painful ulcer. I'm talking about something that would be gross. And not just in one place, but all over his body. He must have been crippled as well. Because the scripture says that he was laid at the rich man's gate. He didn't go and sit down himself. He didn't walk there. No, they, they, they laid him there. The word actually means they dropped him. They chunked him. They would, they would pick him up and they would take him and they'd drop him at the gate. All right, sit there for a while. That's the idea behind this. And it says that also the dogs licked his sores. Now remember, this is not friendly Fido affectionately licking the sores of the man. We're not talking about a freshly manicured French poodle, Mark, Kathy Moody back here. We're not talking about that kind of a dog there. We're talking about a dog that was not man's best friend. You know, today they're man's best friend, but not in the first century. They were ruthless, mangy, flea-infested scavengers that ran in packs. So in all actuality, these dogs were, were not only licking his sores, but but chewing at his sores. He was also extremely hungry. The scripture says that he longed to eat the food that dropped from the rich man's table. Now, now we're talking about scraps and we're talking about bread napkins. Bread napkins, yeah. You see, in the first century, at, at a wealthy uh, celebration, they would actually, at the end of the meal, they would take bread and they would use the bread to get the residual stuff from the meal off their hands so they would use bread and they just kind of wad it up and then they would throw it to the side that's what we're talking about the, the bread crumbs the servants would then kind of go around behind them and they would pick up all the bread crumbs and all the, the scraps and they would take it and they would throw it out the gate and it says that Lazarus desired to join the dogs just join the dogs in the feasting on the scraps now, now, for a moment, when you think about these two men, which one best represents you? Yeah, me too. I, I want to think, you know, I, I sound, I'm not quite like the rich man, but I'm more like the rich man than I am the poor man. That causes me to pay very careful attention to what's coming next. The scripture says you have two men, but also you have two destinies. Both men die. Lazarus, he goes to Abraham's side or to Abraham's bosom. It says that he is escorted to heaven by the angels and there he feasts with Abraham. That's the whole imagery here. It's the imagery of a feast. It's a banquet. And Lazarus is being given the seat of highest honor. Now you have to understand this. When you get to recline next to Abraham, you're in a privileged position. Abraham is the father of faith. He's the father of the Jewish nation. In the mind of a Jew, there would be no greater honor to sit next to an actual person than to sit next to Abraham. It's kind of the picture of John at the Last Supper. Remember when he laid his head 
against the bosom, the chest of Jesus. What an honored position of affection. And here Lazarus is leaning against Abraham. Here, here's the truth. Lazarus was rejected by the elite on earth, but embraced by the elite in heaven. Hmm. There's an old spiritual Negro hymn. You, you remember it? Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Oh, rock of my soul. You know, rock of my soul. Now, in reality, the, the people that are hearing this are scratching their heads. They're like, what? what is this about? According to their theology, the rich man should have been rocking his soul in the bosom of Abraham. Because you see, the, the, the wealthy, the, the rich, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they were the first prosperity theology gospel preachers. And just look at it. You look into it in detail. They were prosperity preachers. If you were rich and you were healthy, it was because God was pleased with you. If you were poor and you were sick, it was because God was not pleased with you. That was their theology. Sound familiar today? Not much has changed, has it? Well, the poor man dies, but the rich man also dies. And he's taken to Hades, Gehenna, uh, hell. All synonyms in this story. It's interesting that upon Lazarus' death, there is no burial. No mention of burial, okay? In reality, you know what they did with Lazarus? Somebody picked him up, took him southeast of Jerusalem, threw him over a hill into the valley of Gehenna, the garbage dump, the place where they burn things and just threw the refuse of society. That's what happened to him. He was just dumped there in Gehenna. However, the rich man, the rich man, you notice the scripture says he was buried. He was buried. I'm sure it was an impressive funeral. However, a luxurious temporal life led to a horrifying eternal death. The text says torment, singular. That's not what the original text says. The original text says torments, plural. He said, I am in torments here. I'm in torments, meaning a multiplicity of things. My suffering is not just physical. My suffering is, is mental, it's emotional, it's relational, it's psychological. I am in torments here. Two men, two destinies. And then two questions. The rich man looking up and seeing Lazarus at Abraham's side asked his first question. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame. Give me a drink of water. Can I have a drink of water? Answer, no. No, you can't. Why? Because there was a chasm. An impassable chasm between them and him. There was no reason. There, there would prohibit any interaction. There would be no further interaction between he and Lazarus. The opportunity for interaction was over. Let that sink in. The opportunity to interact with the helpless and the hopeless of his society was over. Second question. Send someone from here to my brothers so that they do not come to this place. Would you send someone to my brothers? Send someone to my father's house? Answer, no. And in, in, in a nutshell, it's simply, if they don't believe the Bible... They won't believe a person who comes back from the dead. And isn't it interesting that someone named Lazarus actually had come back from the dead? And what did they try to do to him? They tried to kill him again. And then our Lord would also come back from the dead. And guess what? They still would not believe. You see, miracles, miracles do not produce saving faith. The Bible does. Faith comes from hearing the truth, not seeing and experiencing miracles. A lot of people want to experience miracles in the supernatural today. Look, that's not going to produce saving faith. 
What produces saving faith is the undiluted, unpolluted Word of God that nourishes the soul. Okay, we have two men, two destinies, two questions. Now, one lesson. You ready? Here, here's the whole sermon in a nutshell. What I really want you to walk away with. The eternal condition of your soul is best revealed in your response to the needs of others. The eternal condition of your soul is best revealed in your response to the needs of others. Now we know that our response to the needs of others does not save us. But it is one of the greatest evidences that we are saved. You see this in the text? Now James says that, that, that faith without works is dead. It, it's impotent. It, it's powerless. True salvation manifests itself in true concern for the well-being of others. That's what true salvation does. We become new creatures, and a part of our new nature is that we have this longing, this desire, this, this compelling to do something for the helpless and the hopeless of our society. The Syrian, uh, Ephraim the Syrian commented on this story and he said, We cannot hope for pardon at the end unless the fruit of pardon can be seen in us. You know, Jesus can sometimes be confusing, can he? Now, now just be honest, you've been confused sometimes when you read John chapter 15 about the fruit of the vine and being cut off and cast away. You've been confused whenever you've read Matthew chapter 25 about the, the, the final goats and the sheep there. It, it's sometimes confusing. Now, the Bible makes it crystal clear that we are saved by grace through faith and not by works so that none of us can boast that we did something to save ourselves, that we're good enough for God. However... When Jesus tells stories of judgment, he bases acquittal on belief that is evidenced in behavior, not belief alone. Now let that sink in. Belief is monumentally important, but it's the kind of belief that changes your behavior. That's saving faith. In Matthew chapter 25, the goats are distinguished from the sheep not on the basis of belief alone but upon belief that evidenced itself in compassionate behavior. They fed the hungry. They clothed the naked. They visited the sick and imprisoned. Now, if you would have asked this rich man, do you believe in God? Are you a son of Abraham? Do you have paradise in your future? He would have said, absolutely, I believe. But he didn't make it. Why not? Because his belief had not affected his behavior concerning the helpless and the hopeless of his day. Now here's the truth of the story. Those who live in great abundance and luxury in this life and have no concern for the plight of others may find themselves in great anguish and need in the life that is to come. You see, one of the evidences of saving relationship with God is seen in your concern for the poor, your concern for the hurting, your concern for the helpless. Now, the religious leaders of Jesus' day who thought surely they were headed for the privileged seat with Abraham at the eternal banquet would be rudely awakened. Now, to really understand this story, you have to look at this story in context. Do you realize what the context of this story is? If you go back into Matthew chapter 16, you go prior to this story, you find that Jesus has been talking about money. Money and selfish, self-indulgent living. That's what he's, that, you look at them. Those are the stories that precede this story. Money and selfish, self-indulgent living. He said in chapter 16 verse 10, and following that those who did not steward their financial wealth well. And he said that that was using their earthly wealth to make relationships that would continue into eternity. He would say, use your financial resources in such a way that it's going to impact your welcome when you get to eternity. So you're investing it in other people, not just indulging in your own desires. The religious leaders 
they heard this statement and the scripture says that they ridiculed him it means they made fun of him they're like what are you talking about that is the stupidest thing we've ever heard to take our money and use it to benefit other people you know for me to take my funds and help the the helpless and the hopeless of my day see they equated their riches they equated their health as evidence of God's blessing they said well look at me God is blessing me I am rich I'm dressed in all these nice clothes I have these ni this nice home I have this state of the art camel you know, I've got everything they would have laughed at him they said that his teachings were ridiculous look at verse 15 Jesus responds he says you are those who justify yourselves before men but God knows your heart for what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God boy anytime you see the word abomination you need to pay very close attention especially when God calls something an abomination you want to go uh oh okay let's make sure we know what God considers an abomination so he says here what is exalted among men is an abomination before God what men get excited about what men focus their energy on, what men talk about, what they long for, what is that? Money, power, positions, pleasure, opulent houses, fine clothes, lofty ambitions, mammoth portfolios, luxurious vacations. That's what people exalt. And what does Jesus call it? An abomination in the sight of God who now is Jesus saying that these things are, are wrong in and of themselves absolutely not because remember who it was that Lazarus went to be with Abraham was Abraham a pauper uh -uh, he was rich I mean he was wealthy extremely wealthy in fact kings would make treaties with Abraham Abraham had his own private army. I mean, we're talking about a, a filthy rich man, but also a man who was compassionate towards the hurting and the helpless of his day. He was generous. Right after this teaching of Jesus, he then does something kind of weird. And you probably, whenever you came to it a couple of weeks ago in your quiet time, said, what is that doing there? You remember? Remember what it is? It was the teaching about divorce. All of a sudden, Jesus throws in this, this two verses about divorce and remarriage. Like, where'd that come from? You know, Luke, why'd you put that here? That doesn't belong here. Well, you need to understand something. Jesus was addressing the selfish, self-indulgent lifestyle of his day. A lifestyle of his day that said, when your wife no longer pleases you, and you see a new model coming by, you divorce her and you get the new one self-indulgence Jesus was confronting them because they were all about themselves they were trading in their old wives and getting new wives and in the process they were destroying the wives and the futures of their former wives now listen I believe that the primary purpose of this story is to reveal the transformation that should take place in the life of the saved the transformation that should take place in the life of the saved and awaken us to the danger of a selfish, self-indulgent life that has no real concern for others. You see, the forgiven will forgive. The helped will help. The saved will seek to save. The loved will love. The accepted will will accept the chosen will choose and if salvation does not manifest itself in these desires and pursuits then salvation may not have truly come or it may be in still such an, uh, an infantile state that we need to awaken you see our goal is to lean into the desire to help impressed upon us by the spirit within now if you're a believer you know what I'm talking about the desire that is impressed upon us by the spirit living in us that says help them 
they need some help. Do something for them. Hey, be a little bit more generous. Stop just taking care of yourself. Take care of them. You see, that's what the Spirit of God living within us does. And we need to lean into that impression of the Holy Spirit. Now listen to me. Don't talk yourself out of helping, caring, and loving. Ever happen? Happens to me all the time. I feel prompted by the Spirit to do something, and then I start talking myself out of it. Well, they're they're there, and they're in that situation. It's their own fault. I'm not responsible. Don't justify withholding from others. Don't live in luxury while others barely live. You see, the rich man's love of money that bloomed into a callous, self-justifying neglect of the needs of others. Love of money will do that to you. It'll calcify your heart towards others. Now look, there's nothing wrong with money. I'm not saying that we ought to sell everything that we have and be paupers in life. I'm saying that we ought to be compassionate to the needy and responsive to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. The same can happen to us. We can be calcified if we're not careful. Wealth does not always calcify the heart, but it often does. And we want to be careful. Let me close with this. I think it's really interesting that the rich man knew the name of Lazarus. He knew him by name. Now that, that's interesting. He knew him by name, but he ignored his every need. Now just for a moment, I want you to think, who do you know by name that you're ignoring? Who do you know by name that has a real, a genuine need that you're ignoring? You see, true followers of Jesus Christ will not be indifferent to the helpless and the hopeless around them. The eternal condition of our soul will be revealed in our response. Let's bow before the Lord together. Lord Jesus, you gave to us this parable to reveal the potential ugliness that occurs in our life when we become self-indulgent, self-centered, addicted to pleasure and luxury. Lord Jesus, forgive us. Help us not to be this way. Lord, help us to know the balance. I know it's hard, Father. There are people that are in need that, that, that simply because of the life circumstances we should not engage. Lord, there are people all over the world who are in need that we need to be responding to. Father, I thank you for a church that when I put out the call to feed starving children, they respond and we send food all over the world. And Lord, when we have in gatherings, the, the funds come in. And when we provide for our food pantry, it comes in. And Lord, I thank you for a church that has a budget that includes the needs of people in it. And Lord, I pray that in the days ahead that we would learn how to give even more away. That, Lord, you would make us wise to know how to, how to steward our resources to where it really helps those that are hurting and doesn't perpetuate a spirit of socialism and, and entitlement. And, Lord, you know, this is our struggle. We all struggle with this, Lord, of knowing when is our help really going to be help. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask that in the coming days you would make that clear to us to show us really how to help Lord, I guess when it comes to an either-or and we're just not sure, we ought to err on the side of generosity and not on the side of stinginess. So help us, Father. Lord, one day we're going to go to heaven. We're going to be with you. And Lord, in that day, every person that we have helped will remember. And Lord, every person that we have helped, you will perceive as helping you. So Lord, may there be an abundance of reward on our court date, which Lord is not a date of condemnation, but a date of coronation, a date of celebration. And we look forward to it, Lord. 
Lord, when all the wood and the hay and the stubble of false motives are burned away and the only thing left is that which was done out of love for you and gratitude for, to you and love for people will remain. I pray that, Lord, we will have great eternal riches left that we can then lay at your feet and know that we have done well with what you entrusted to us in this earth. Lord, as we sing now, help us reflect upon that day. Lord, those who need to talk with someone, give them courage to pick up a phone and text that number that will be on the screen and have someone call and talk with them. But we give this time to you. Help us as we sing. Amen. Let's stand together.